Hello and welcome back to World War II TV and the concluding part of Eastern Front Week, which seems to have come to an end very, very quickly. Uh, I'm reminding you that Jungles Week starts tomorrow. So uh, well, I'll get that right in at the, at the beginning of the show. So five o'clock UK time tomorrow afternoon, we start with a look at the John Bazilone Medal of Honor action in Guadalcanal with my old friend Brian Dimitrovich. So that'll be a really good show. Then we've got Lance Zedrick continuing his discussion about the Alamo Scouts on Sunday. But right now, it's back to Eastern Front, and I hope you've been following the shows you've been doing so far this week. Variety of speakers, variety of subjects. But we're finishing with a look at artillery, uh, which has been described as being kind of the, one of the force multipliers for the Soviet forces in World War II, and to discuss whether or not that's the case and, and to put some data behind some of the information. My guest today kind of, kind of stepped in quite last minute, really, because I lost, I was down, I guess. So... Sasso Shas, bleh, I just was just talking about pronunciation name, pronunciating. Oh god, I'm gonna start that whole sentence again. Let's cut this bit, editor. Um, yeah, I've been talking about pronunciation and there, boom, I get it wrong. So Sasho Todorov has been studying artillery and eastern front and data. It the show today is predominantly about the acquiring of data and looking at sources and what we can learn from that. So Sasho, good afternoon. How are you doing? Doing pretty well. How about yourself? Well, apart from the fact I've got a cold and I just mangled a, a whole sentence there, but it happens every now and then. My brain uh, doesn't work quite as it should do. Anyway, right. So, as I said there, this is something we're going to be looking at, the Red God of War. It's been written about. It's become kind of a label. I've seen that quote attributed to Stalin, various other people, Zukov, whatever. The point is, is that we're going to look at what exactly artillery did and and we'll go through the PowerPoint in a minute. But before we do that, you're an attorney by day, and this is something you do kind of part-time. Why the interest in Eastern Front? Tell us a bit about how your interest has developed, and tell us about what you are using in terms of sources. So my interest in the Eastern Front, I mean, I've been interested in military history in general since I was a young kid. Like a lot, like a lot of young kids, find the library, really get into it. Maybe to a degree your parents aren't exactly happy with, um, and then kind of develop from there. Uh, my interest in really focusing on the Eastern Front actually comes a lot from my participation on an online discussion. Um, because so a lot of, especially ac kind of your more pseudo academic discussion online through more formalized sites like Reddit's War College has kind of really shifted to focusing on the Eastern Front when it comes to World War II. Because to a large degree, the Western theater, it's fairly well settled, while the Eastern theater has been a continually roiling flux kind of discussion there's still very much the enemy at the gates impression, which has a lot of politics associated with it. And also kind of with the rise of online, very leftist politics, you've seen kind of a counter narrative emerge, also really celebrating the Soviet Union. So naturally that's been one of the major battlefronts and that really inspired me to go kind of deeper into the Eastern Front in part because as I was becoming a moderator of one of the, one of, probably one of the largest online communities of serious military historians, well, you, I mean, I need to be moderating these. I need to actually be, you know, the fact checking, toning down discussions and everything else is very important. So that's where what really led me into the world of really using data. Because I think that, and this is, and I've done a lot of similar work with World War I as well, which is that when we're talking about these large wars, which are often explicitly framed as attritional, you really need the numbers behind it. Every soldier thinks that he's in the middle of the most intense fighting he's ever seen in his life. Every soldier thinks he might, that he's on being overwhelmed under a tide of humanity. And the thing is, for his squad, that might be true. But and on a wider front wide front picture, we have to pierce through the narratives, and that requires hard data. In terms of the information I'm using, a lot of the work I'm using, one, is as a source a lot of people will be familiar with, is David Glantz. However, there's also been some really interesting work by a Russian historian. And this is what really broke open this field for me, which was Alexei Isayev, who back in 2010, and as I'll go into this later, posted an incredible data set that he had compiled. He's now one of the leading Russian World War II historians. But back then, he was still sort of like me, a younger, kind of a younger enthusiast operating within these online spaces. And he posted this incredible data set where he had managed to compile to a fairly good degree of accuracy ammunition consumption by year with the Soviets, the Germans, and the Americans. And that really allowed some playing around with, and that really started getting me interested really in artillery for the Eastern Front, because you start seeing some really interesting patterns of shell consumption that really bring to question a lot of the classic narratives. And that's what we'll be, we'll be going into here when why there is a question mark next to the Red God of War. 
Exactly. I mean, when when we discussed the show and I made the graphic, you suggested the addition of a question mark because that's essentially what we're discussing today is whether or not it was the force multiplier, the battle winner, because, you know, I, I'm a Normandy scholar, as you know, and mm-hmm. despite what people think from the movies and the machine guns and grenades, the majority of people killed in Normandy were killed by either artillery or mortars. And with the confine of the Bocage, probably a lot more by mortars there. I don't know that anyone's precisely worked out the data. People like Joe Valkowski's done some work uh, with his the study of the 29th Division. But certainly, it's not the movie image of people being killed by someone shooting around a corner with a rifle or a Tommy gun or, or an MP4, although that did happen, of course, to some extent. It's the artillery that is mm-hmm. uh, the, 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 the real fact, especially when you move to the sword beach area and Caen and Monty and all the totalized and tractable when artillery was just, even you know, the army group, the artillery, the agoras we had there, the army our artillery units of just massive numbers. So I think we are understanding that artillery is a huge, huge factor, but it's, but the, as you say, the Eastern front is a little bit more of a uh, unknown area for people like myself and a lot of people watching this to kind of get to grips with. So, mm-hmm. You'll you'll tell me when to move on through the um th- through the slides. So this is the goals we're going to be aiming for tonight. So um yeah. Yeah, so as I said before, like what I want to do is to delve beyond when it comes to these front, I think there's a tendency to be like, oh, the T34, which had sloped armor at 45 degrees. We're talking about these very it's a very James approach to the war, which I think also is kind of founded by how we interact with the war. A lot of us interact through World War II with video games, um, including from the older, like if you know. That we always joke about dad games, your kind of hex, your classic hex, Panzer Commander games. But it, this, it's, it is a major factor of how we interact with it. We interact in a very Jane's equipped, you know, very Jane's fighting ships approach. What I want to do is kind of pierce through that and kind of go down to the deeper nature of how warfare actually works, and particularly on the Eastern Front. Also, I mean, as part of this, you know, as kind of related to that, you know, the goal is to aim, is to arm the audience all you lovely bunch who are hopefully subscribing and have blocked and are not blocking ads with this video, all needs to make his money. We need, like, it's basically to give you better tools, they're really to equip you with tools to examine narratives when you're reading subsequent books by these front, tools to examine what is the author saying? How is the author approaching something? And whether he's really, and whether something's being missed. Also, and as kind of this will go towards the end, these are also very useful tools for considering a lot of modern defense issues. And this will kind of as kind of a teaser, but this directly plays into the collapse of the Afghan National Army, which we saw la- which we saw last month. So there's a lot of issues that came into some of the problems with the use of artillery on the Eastern Front that are still in play. And finally, as it says, mock pompous dr- jungers because these German aristocrats, well, they're, you know, they're not nice people. So what's my yeah. it's always a good chance. They got to they got to write their own history for a while, and I think it's time we take them down the bag. Okay. So, so, there's there's mm-hmm. your contact details, people that want to get in touch with you, and you know, we'll we'll but we'll keep on going. So um I'm yeah, looking forward sounds to Sounds good. So, and um, as a quick and as a quick note, please send all complaints to at 38 God. Continue on. Good. Right. Here we go. Okay, so what really is 20th century uh, warfare? And as I says, contemplating our steel navels. Because as I said before, to me, a lot of the Jane's fighting ship approach, it's very, it's naval contemplation. It is, angles of armor don't really matter for a lot of this. Uh, continue on. I call it the top trumps, uh, which, is the, <laughs> which is the equivalent, British equivalent of the Jane. Well, I mean, we have Jane as well, but top trumps is everything is comparing across speed, height, armament. Mm-hmm range and and my tank beats yours your aircraft beats mine and 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 we've been trying to move away from that although that is still a a very very you um regularly used way of compar- comparing forces in in even some very very well known best selling books still do it at that this aircraft flies faster than this aircraft therefore it's the better aircraft and uh, as with artillery it's even more complicated because of um Types of anyway, we'll get into it. But yeah, yeah, so. but yeah, but and I said before, it's because we engage with this through video games and through video games. One of the reasons why this is kind of why this question is particularly important for those of you who are primarily coming from kind of engaging with video games. You know, we'll see these are not weapons. A tank is not a weapon. An artillery piece is not a weapon. A machine gun piece is not a weapon. A bomber is not a weapon. All these weapons are instead bandwidth for this. The plane is merely a bandwidth. The plane is a carrier for bombs. The machine gun is a through point for, for bullets. The tank is a through point for shells and bullets. 
machine gun, artillery is a through point for shells. If I were to take if I were to take a machine gun and I have no bullets, all I have is a very expensive heavy metal club. If I were to take a bullet, put it in a vice, hit the back of it with a hammer, if someone's standing in front of that, they're going to have a bad time. The yeah. bullet is the weapon, the shell is the weapon, the tank and the artillery piece, though you can parade it, though it seems like it's the weapon, those are just bandwidth. So now we're going to get into a little bit that's kind of theoretical and philosophical, but I think is really important. This is kind of one of the most important tools I think people should take away with moving forward, which is that war is the infliction of violence. It sounds obvious, but it's, it means a little bit something deeper here, which is that if you think about what are the two main components of warfare, it is maneuver and it is casualty infliction. Well, how do you maneuver? If there's no enemies around, you can just move at will. But if there's enemies around, modern forces are capable of throwing so much violence in the air. And by violence, I just mean like potential threat. They're capable of throwing so much violence in the air that the only way to move in the face of the enemy is either A, to have sufficient armor, or B, to be using violence of yourself to suppress the enemy. In order to think, inflict casualties, you have to inflict violence. What does this mean? Your ability to move on the battlefield, your ability to threat the enemy, are both directly related to the sheer amount of explosives and steel that you can direct in the general area of the enemy. In a lot of ways, it's it's like two drunk, if you've ever been in a bar and see two drunk people fighting, it's a lot like that. It's a lot of throwing punches in the air, maybe one in a thousand actually lands, but the whole point is to psychologically and physically create a denial zone around you to either deny the enemy movement or to allow you to move. Now, in World War II, and this is something that's often forgotten, because once again, the big thing with World War II, thanks to, in part thanks to video games, is that World War II is tanks and planes. It's these very physical, is these very physical, tangible vehicles zooming around. In reality, World War II is much like World War I in that the primary tool for inflicting violence is still artillery. The primary tool that both armies have to control each other's movement or to inflict casualties is through the artillery tube. Now, unfortunately for the Eastern Front, getting data, yeah, what's frustrating is that the data is available, it's just obtaining it now is significantly harder. So one, because the, the German record keeping system basically collapses in, in mid to late 1944. This is one of the major problems we have with actually knowing how many men the, German, the Germans actually lost because like all wars, World War II became significantly more violent as it came to a close. Unfortunately, the, the Soviet medical study of the war was available about 10 years ago online in all the volumes. Unfortunately, it was no longer online, so I wasn't able to confirm my numbers, but they, I remember them roughly aligning with what we have for the U.S. And this is kind of really to give an idea of from the U.S., which is that thanks to the American medical study of the war, in, along the Western Front, 53% of wounds were caused by shell fragments and 62% of fatal wounds were from shell fragments. So, and if you, and this also aligns with World War One data, where shells, as the French, the French basically calculated that in a battle where most of the casualties are being inflicted by machine guns, you're looking at about a four to one or five to one uh, wounded to killed ratio, and if, it's a and if it's an artillery battle, it's about a three to one. So artillery is significantly, not only is it an easier to way put metal in the air, it's also a significantly more lethal form of doing so. So now let's start talking about indirect fire. We're going to be talking about the concentration of violence. So I think an important thing to remember is that oftentimes, so to return to the video game example, how do you break through? You concentrate forces in an area. The problem is that there's only so much violence you can concentrate through direct fire means, i.e. either through infantry or through tanks. So for example, a BF, the World War I saw the greatest force concentrations we'll ever see in, World War, in, in modern warfare. And even then, a BEF division attacking on the Somme along one mile front, so an incredibly concentrated unit, only has about 16 platoons in contact with the enemy. It's two up, two back for every single, for every sing, uh, at every single command level, it's two up, two back. And so you only have about 500 to 700 men in contact which is one of the reasons why an outnumbered force can hold on as long as the defensive line holds intact, because even if you severely outnumber the enemy, in reality, at the point of contact, at the point where men are actually capable of shooting at each other, for the most part, you're going to have relatively rough parity until you really start breaking in. So, in or if you want to break through, how do you do so? There's only two real ways. You either concentrate violence through a denser form of violence, which is the tank. Within a mile, you can concentrate Easily, you know, about, about 100 tanks per mile was not an unknown concentration. So through that, you've just created a much denser form of violence, which is because each tank is carrying machine guns and an artillery piece, because that's what the tank is. The tank is an armored mobile artillery piece. Or you do so through indirect fires. 
indirect because with artillery, you can stack it up behind the lines and you can have a dense, you can have a larger concentration of fire because once again, you don't need one man in front. It's not a direct fire weapon, it's indirect. So you can you can stack that, which is actually very important in terms of your actual ability to achieve a deeper concentration of violence on the enemy, which not only means your ability to inflict casualties upon them, but also your ability, which is critical, to suppress them. Because the reason why BF Division only has 500, 700 men up front is because unlike the Napoleonic Wars, you can't pack men rank to rank anymore. You can't overwhelm men, the enemy, with men anymore because they're throwing so much violence at you that you'd be asking for casualties, which would rapidly render the unit completely combat in effect. So here's a little flowchart, and this is something that'll be kind of important to understand, especially later on. So how does artillery inflict violence? Well, there's four primary sources. There's heavy industry, chemical industry, the educational system, and the electronics industry. The heavy industry produces the guns themselves, the bandwidth, but also the casing for the shells, which is quite important. Shells consume a lot of resources. If you take, for example, a, a Soviet divisional gun, the ZIS-3, it was fairly light, but a Soviet divisional gun weighed about 1,800 kilograms. Its shell weighed six kilograms. Now, some of that is, is, is the chemical filler, but within about 300 shells, within about 300, 400 shells, that divisional gun has consumed more resources in shells than it took to actually produce the gun itself. Ammunition is not just some vague number. In fact, it's a colossal resource. So the heavy industry produces the guns and the cases for the shells. Chemical industries produces the explosives, which you need to both propel the shells and fill the shells. As the educational system produces the gunners and spotters, which are critical, you need, those are educated positions right there, requiring a fairly significant amount, a relatively significant amount of information and training. And the electronics industry produces another critical element, which is communication tools. You need telephones and you need radios if you want to get those rounds on target. And so as you notice here, each of these four things, guns, shells, um, the human factor and communication tools are each critically important for getting effective violence, i.e. rounds on target. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that central planners and often, often civilian central planners, but even a lot of military planners, they focus on a single thing. The guns, because the guns are, for the most part, the easiest, that's the one, the most tangible thing, but two, it's often the easiest thing to produce. Heavy industry, for the most part, the first, we're talking about the products, the first industrial revolution, which was the steelmaking revolution of the 1850s. The second industrial revolution, the chemical revolution, came significantly later and is significantly more complex. The electronics industry is also significantly more complex. So oftentimes these guns, that is the easiest and quickest thing to up the numbers in your park with. And it's also the most visible things. Those are the things you parade down Moscow on the, uh, on, during, the red, during, the, during the celebratory parades. The problem is it's only one of four factors for getting rounds on target. And so a lot of parties go into a conflict drastically overestimating their actual potential because they have all this equipment on hand. But as we said at the start, the guns are not the weapon, the shells are the weapon. And this is kind of what I discussed. Basically, it's the problem of visibility. It's basically guns are the most visible thing to a civilian planner, to a military leader, because you're not going to be burning a lot of shells in training, because those are expensive, to your civilian population, and also to the enemy. The guns are visible. But it's all the intangibles that actually allow them to commit violence. And this will be something that's very important for historians. And that just that's, that's, mm -hmm. even works on a simple level. Of, of something like, and I know this, we're not discussing it tonight, but anti-aircraft guns. If you're on an mm -hmm. aircraft flying over and you see lots of guns below, you don't have no idea how many shells they've got behind them, what sort of ranging equipment they've got, how many personnel they're on duty, what warning system they've got. But if you see lots of guns, your, your, your impression is there's a dangerous um, position you're flying over that it may or mm -hmm. may not be the case. But as you say, it's a very visible and obvious thing. In very true, because if you said before, it's that's the bandwidth. All those guns, that is the potential bandwidth of threat that they can pose to you. But the question is, as I said before, you don't know, well, if they have radar fuses, suddenly, and something, even if you know how much flak is appearing around you, it may seem like relatively few amounts is popping up. But if those are radar fuses, as the Germans started, to, and this is the Germans and especially the Japanese discovered in 1944, 1945, suddenly, that threat, the actual threat you're under, is significantly larger than the amount of bandwidth you believe you're facing. Yep, super. 
I'll hand it back to you because I, I, I have to say I, I do some shows where I feel eminently qualified to join in the conversations and others where I'm going to just sit and listen. And this is very much in the latter category <laughs> today. So I'm basically going to sit down back and listen. But we do have a number of gunners watching. And mm -hmm. Chris there is mentioning that electronics and signals is often forgotten. So uh, if you're pleasing the gunners, then you're pleasing me. And then therefore you're pleasing the audience. So we'll just keep on going. Sounds good. And thanks for the commentary, Chris. So uh, next line. All right, so the classic narrative, and as I titled it, you have a lot of spare time to defend yourself when you're unemployed. Um, because, well, for Mr. Guderian up there in the top left corner, well, the German leaders, they didn't have much else to do until we started, re you know, until we started putting them back into the ranks in the 1950s to rebuild the West German army. And so they spend, they have basically 10 years, and really they have about 40 years until the opening of the Soviet archives and we start seeing a new wave of scholarship. They have a very long time to essentially set the narrative for the Eastern Front that they want to use. They get to set the tone, and that tone still controls. That's why I use the photo from and me at the gates. And also, even then, a lot of the even a lot of our historical photos and even a lot of our more historical information about it has at times leaned into it because of our lack of information on the Russian on the on the Soviet side. Um, and as a quick note, um, when I correct myself with Russian Soviet, that is kind of it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, but I do think it's important. Like the Soviet Union was not Russia. The Soviet Union, we're talking about massive amounts, you know, Central Asians produced about 15 to 20 percent of, especially in 1941 and 1942, when Ukraine and Belarus were lost. You know, Central Asia was a critical source of support, the Caucasus. The Soviet Union was a federal state. Yeah. And so, and, all, and also kind of, and I pulled up Hearts of Iron 4 there, because it was kind of the tie into the video game aspect of things. It'll tie into one of the elements of the classic narrative, which, as I'll set up, the Germans sell themselves as having lost a material shock. They, as having lost a material battle. And so Hearts of Iron 4 video games, when they're trying to replicate the casualty ratios that we saw during World War II battles, they often, what they'll often do is give the Soviet Union's malices compared to what you'd expect them to have, but give them a lot more productive capacity, basically leaning into that material battle narrative, which we'll discuss in the next slide. So basically, what I'm the reason why I'm using Material Schlock 2.0 is that this is very much how the Germans framed why they lost in World War One, which is that we were, you know, we fought fantastically, but we were drowned under a tide of humanity and equipment. We f we swam up or upstream against a torrent of shells. However, and, and the, sorry, and the thing is, is that what supports a lot of this is how the imagery they used of the Eastern Front when they were writing their histories, because a lot of these, a lot of them are writing for the U.S. Army. They're writing their experiences and they're writing their analysis of the Soviet Army in the post-war period, because now, while well, the U.S. Army is staring down the Soviets along the German along the frontier. So one of the key images is of this material schlocked, and it's some. I don't know actually if it's an intentional or unintentional because you never know what's going on behind the enemy's line. So their images are of these crushing initial bombardments of, you know, the opening bombardment of Stalingrad, of discussing, for example, during the Soviet offensives that they finally re 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 reopened Leningrad, they were discussing kind of like there was a particularly a fierce account of a German, a German officer saying, you know, my lines just disappeared under this torrent of shells. And even as we've moved into a more balanced and nuanced discussion on the Eastern Front, as we've moved away from that classic human wave drowning under a tide of humanity aspect, we still, this imagery of these crushing bombardments and this, of this crushing material deficiency still controls because we have, as we'll discuss later, the numbers are there, it's just once again, it's what's behind, happening behind the lines that are, that are more important. So as I said before, front lines disappearing under a tide of Soviet shells, utter destruction of the capacity to resist. In the, in, even in, his, in history today, there'll be a recitation of the number of artillery tubes the Soviets were lining up for these offensives. The problem is, and this, kind of, this is a little bit more on the, you know, the Jane's fighting ship side, is when you look at the number of artillery tubes, the tubes that the Soviets are lining up are significantly lighter. The Soviet divisional gun is a 75 millimeter piece. The Germans are lining up 105 millimeter piece. That's more than twice the weight of shell that the German gun is firing. The Soviets also, this is something that a lot of historians don't, don't understand, the Soviets also counted mortars, especially their lighter mortars, into their list of artillery tubes. And so oftentimes when you hear, oh, the Soviets concentrated 30,000 tubes to the Germans 7,000 or 8,000, that's not actually a very good description, not only of the potential bandwidth, 
but also the potential violence can flow through that dam. Yep, I'm following this. This is good. So we're going to talk about kind of from the more academic side. These are kind of the trope codifiers, which is you have the Red God of War, which was kind of a history of Soviet artillery. This was written during the Cold War period in 1985. And it's really more about the, the modern Soviet army today and their relationship with artillery kind of as a way of helping the U.S. Army prepare for what they might be, fa what they might be facing along the North German plain. There's also uh, David Zabecki, uh, David Zabecki is with a knife here, uh, Steel Wind. Um, steel, you know, Steel Wind is primarily about World War One German artillery use. It's kind of, it's one of the best books looking at the advent of indirect fires in, in the advent of deep battle. However, it also helps solidify some of these academic tropes because a key part of Steel Wind is, as he later discusses, is the way in which the Soviets adopt a lot of Brook Muller's techniques of these very carefully planned, carefully regimented, mechanically intricate bombardments. And what they combine together is to give the idea of reinforcing this idea that the Soviets, they broke through because they were able to just concentrate artillery. Through a mastery of artillery, they were able to win the indirect fires war, they were able to win the material schlock and break through the end and, and break through the enemy. And as I said before, this continues to define our views. And even I, I pulled up, for example, like here's how Beaver, you know, Anthony Beaver, here's how, how he opens the, on the Uranus offensive for Stalingrad. You know, the ground began shaking as if from a low intensity earthquake. The ice and puddles cracked like old mirrors. The bombardment was so intense that 30 miles to the south, medical officers in the 22nd Panzer Division were woken from a heavy sleep. Now, mind you, this is a quote, but this is still, this is the choice of the quote. You know, what was the first, what was the impression he decided to give to illustrate what the Germans were viewing at the time? And once again, this, this plays back into this idea of this overwhelming, crushing initial bombardment, the material schlock. Well, what's the problem? I don't know how many of your audience will get that, but if you watch Scooby Doo, I, I assure you it is both clever. And I got it instantly. I'm a big Scooby Doo <laughs> aficionado. Then, and you know, so so just for those who are watching, we you know we're, this is th th we've just established how the narrative has been told that there's this incredible um, uh, ability for the Soviets to re unleash this hellish, huge war, you know, battle deciding bombardments and now we're actually going to take it apart and, and look at what the reality was. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to get into the irritating questions because these, if you're a serious scholar of the Eastern Front, these are questions you have to deal with. The fact of the matter is German Soviet casualties are very divergent until Bagrat, until Bagrationi. Especially given the force concentrations the Soviets were able to mass, these casualty ratios, which could often reach three to four to one when we're talking about wounded and killed, you know, oftentimes a missing in, like missing in action, prisoners of prisoners of war, that's an operational casualty. Direct combat casualties are killed and wounded. And the killed and wounded diverge drastically, and they should not be. At times, we're looking at killed and wounded ratios, which are more akin to what the Japanese were facing fighting against a very under-equipped warlord armies of, the, of China. And we have to reckon with this question. So now, some at times there's been some. Oh, uh, any comments on the Katyusha was important. Well, I mean, was the Katyusha, the rocket artillery? It's the Katyusha. It was important. It was a, It's an important tool. Rocket artillery is a matter. You cause most of your casualties within the first about minute of a bombardment. Um, which is why one of the reasons why during World War One you see a shift to kind of these rolling hurricane bombardments because you kill. You kill infantry when it's out of cover, which is one of the reasons why, like most of the time, you kill infantry. You have to, for in order to cause an infantry casualty, you have to flush them out of cover and you have to catch them in the open. Katyushas are important because you, you know, a, cut, a rocket artillery allows you to just drop an immense amount of explosive along an area within a couple of seconds. That is a very valuable tool to have. It's, it's, it's a useful capacity, same reason why the Germans had significant amounts of rocket artillery. Also, particularly interestingly, and interestingly, very useful during counter battery if you can catch a unit um, in the open. That being said, and this is kind of something kind of important, avoid viewing any one tool as a war winner. You know, like the T-34 is often, oh, the war winning T-34. No, the T-34 is just, it's a tank. Within, for the most part, because for the most part, tanks are fighting other infantry and anti-tank guns, for the most part, a tank's value comes from being a tank. 
And well, this is this yeah. is the age-old argument that's come up on World War II TV of the comparison between the MG42 and the Bren gun or the T-34 and the Tiger. It's you can't just compare the, the, those two things. You have to compare doctrine, tactics, training, uh, maintenance, uh, supplies, all those other factors there. The morale, terrain. Mm -hmm. There's a there's so many factors before you can actually start. Yeah, as you say, you you end up with the Jane's stroke top trumps approach which is 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 fundamentally flawed or even if you want to go into jane's ergonomics the t-34 has great numbers from a jane's perspective great numbers from a video games perspective and if you actually try to fight in it the ergonomics are terrible which is a major problem considering that the main point of a tank is identifying and rapidly responding to enemies yeah no definitely are we, are we ready to move on? I've lost where yeah. we are. So uh, we are. we're on the air. Uh, I would pull back one last thing. So just kind of as a as kind of a setup for like what's going to follow here, which is basically it's a really critical important, really critical stress that these casualty differentials and this discrepancy really lies at the core of law, the Eastern Front discourse online, and it is one of the problematic aspects about the German narrative is that, well, if they're wrong, if they weren't this elite force mowing down the red hordes, why do the numbers seemingly support? Then why do they seemingly support these ratios? Which is why, for the most part, if you've seen kind of the Eastern Front discourse, you see a lot of the shift of discourse to defending Soviet operational. Talking about deep battle, talking about Maskirovka, which is just Soviet. That's just a Russian word for deception. But it's 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 definitely had an impact on shifting where the discourse occurs. Cool. So, well, okay, now the answer to this has been bubbling up from so there's been several sources which have been kind of popping up over the past 15 to 20 years. First, David Glantz, in his later works, as it notes here, he has increasingly began noting the clumsiness of Soviet artillery use and their heavy, dep and their heavy, heavy dependence upon the success of the initial bombardment. If he goes into, because as he's really done a lot of great research, and it's one of the reasons why he got frozen out of a lot of Soviet, of the Russian archives, he's done a lot in his later research, really focused on these failed Soviet offensives, these failed and hidden Soviet offensives. For example, the bloodbath that was, you know, before Bagrationi, the Soviets made another attempt earlier in 1944 to break through the Belarusian shelf, to break through the, the Belarusian shelf, and it was a bloodbath. It, that just completely failed. Or even if you look at the Soviet counteroffensive, we always always talk about, you know, the Soviet counteroffensive against Kursk. That's great. That's just the beginning of July. The Soviets spend from July all the way through 1943 slowly moving through Ukraine and absolutely shredding their units along the way. The Soviets lose the probably the, the and remember I running the ran the numbers a couple of years ago, the most casually intense period for the Soviets when it comes to killed and wounded was that second half of 1943 as they just fritter away their units, slowly pushing forward. And so the question is why? Given their force differentials, given that they have the Germans on the back foot, given all this, why is this happening? And this is, as discussed before, kind of from the second really critical source that really kind of opened this up for me was Alexei Isayev, who is now in the leading World War II, um, Russian um, scholars of World War II, and who back in 2010, back during his more form days, he posed this massive data set of Soviet and German ammunition consumption by year during the war. Well, what did this data reveal? When you calculate it out, when you basically, when you multiply shell consumption by shell weight, as in what's actually falling on the enemy, the truth is, it was actually the Germans who were controlling the artillery war. In 1942, in 1942, now, these are this is German total consumption, so we do have to account for the West. That being said, especially in 1942 and 1943, Western consumption, there's, just, there's not that many German units out in the Western theater, either in Northern Africa or in Italy. These are relatively minor forces compared to the Eastern Front, but you can discount them to a degree, but not enough to really shift the ratio, especially 1942. And if you look at 1942, this is where you really start seeing what was happening. 446,000 4, 446, tons to 700 and basically 710,000 um, tons of German shell fire. That is nearly, that is, that's a one to 1.6 ratio. Minus North sure. Africa, let's bring it down, let's say one to 1.4. That is still a significant differential in how many shells the Germans were dropping on the Soviets compared to respond, compared to what the Soviets were able to do in response. And when you start looking at that, suddenly you start realizing, oh, hey, that's why the 1942 casualties really start seeing such a discrepancy. Because simply put, as we talked about at the start, warfare is violence. You're either throwing, you're throwing violence at the enemy to suppress his own ability to throw violence at you. Uh, no, it is not. I specifically excluded AHLs. Um, no because of that very much, because of that very reason, because if you look at the AA war, 
anti-aircraft fire was a colossal drain on German resources. One of the major understated elements of the air campaign actually was the simple amount of resources it was burned through for the Germans defending against that. Because all the explosives going into 88 millimeter anti-aircraft shells are explosives not going into 105 and 155 millimeter artillery shells. And thank you. He's got a commentary about being specific, and I'm happy to be able to provide. So, That's quite why I'm saying geeky, I think, really. It's between <laughs> you and I. But yeah, no, geeky is good. We like geeky. Geeky yeah. is good. And what's particularly important is on specific battlefields, especially when the Germans have the initiative, this can rate and reach an even higher ratio. Christopher, when we talk about geeky, Christopher Lawrence at the Dupuy Institute, who wrote the 1300 page study of the Battle of Kursk, one of the best studies. If you're interested in Kursk, it is surprisingly cheap if you find it online and very much worth it. But he found a 2.3 to 1 German shell tonnage to Soviet shell tonnage consumption ratio. Suddenly, that 4 to 1 casualty ratio inflict, that, would, that the Germans inflicted while attacking into a defensive network outnumbered suddenly starts making a lot more sense. They're dumping a lot more shells on the enemy. And also it's important that they're, they're inflicting violence through safer means, and they're better directing that violence. What do I mean by safer? Artillery really doesn't, until the unit collapses, artillery really doesn't take casualties. Even during probably the height of counter-battery work, which is World War I, 1917 to 1918, where you have constant overflight, heavily concentrated artillery, geographically concentrated artillery, tons of shells and artillery in static positions near the line. Even then, artillery is taking significant, at most 10% of the total casualties. So when you're inflicting violence through artillery, you're inflicting it in a very casualty-safe method. You're also The Germans also had a major advantage in the direction of violence, which is because they have significantly better developed communications, electronics industries, and a significantly more educated populace. What does that mean? Well, one, they have more radios, though they're nothing like the Allies in terms of radio concentration, but they have more radios. They don't have to rely upon telephone lines. If they have telephone lines, they've got more redundant lines. They have better network set up. They have a more educated populace to man those radios and telephone lines, or to become gunners that have the mathematical inclination needed. Um, how much of the weight difference is the result in different caliber sizes? The Germans were still firing more shells. However, different caliber sizes was a major, was a major difference. Um, if you look at the disproportion, kind of the numbers, um, Soviet, the Soviet weight of fire is heavily bulked out by their 76 millimeter divisional guns. Whereas when you go into kind of heavy artillery pieces, like the fact that the German divisional gun is 105 millimeter, it is, it makes a major difference. This, the German advantage in heavy artillery was very decisive. And that matters because when it comes to actually, because the Eastern Front, we often think about it as this vast mobile battle. In reality, the Eastern Front, for the most part, is heavily positional. A lot of it's fighting along trench lines. You know, I know you had a very good talk on Stalingrad earlier this week. The bulk of the fighting at Stalingrad was occurred through basically trench fighting along the Kotlebin Heights to the north of the, the north that of the city. One of my favorite things Dave, David Stahl said is that we are drawn when we look at maps of the Stalingrad battle to the movement of arrows. You look at the, mm -hmm. the, the you know, August, September, October, November, but actually some of the most significant fighting was in the areas where there were no movement of arrows because it was, as you said there, these uh, lines almost the First World War-style trench warfare, mm -hmm. where, where actually there was some serious fighting going on, but that's not the way we, as, as, as human beings, just attracted mm -hmm. to the movement of arrows. And so uh, that was one mm -hmm. of my greatest takeaways in that show. So, and there's also, I think there's also an aesthetic appeal to it. You know, it's weird to say aesthetic, but it, you know, there is, that is the problem with the warfare. Warfare has a compelling aesthetic to it. The urban fighting, you know, this is kind of always always talk about the problems of approaching warfare, because a lot of us come through here through video games. You know, it is, there's a reason why it's extremely difficult and near impossible to create a quote unquote fun operational World War One game or even a World War One shooter game. It's because from an aesthetic standpoint, this trench fighting, it's, it's ugly and it's slow and it's gritty. But at the end of the day, this is what most of the fighting that's occurring here. Most of these offensives, they only become mobile once the trench battle has been lost. You know, yeah. that's what happens. Go back to Stalingrad, that's what happens. Zhukov spends, I think he makes seven attempts to break through the Kotlebin Heights, and it's the final one just happens to coincide with the Serafimovich offensive as part of Uranus. Uh, does, this issue, do the, does the issues with manufacturing quality fit into the numbers on Soviet artillery? I'll get into manufacturing, not a matter of manufacturing quality. In fact, the Soviets were more than matching the, the Germans in terms of manufacturing quality of artillery. It's, uh, it's a question of shells. It's a matter, matter of manufacturing complexity. So, okay. base, 
basically, as I said before, they're inflicting safer violence and they're directing the violence. They're better directing the violence. And is it also fair to say, because you were saying about it, the importance of that first bombardment, whichever side it is. And I always say, again, because I'm a Normandy scholar, that's what I draw on, is that when, when, for example, the American Fifth Corps are, are moving south from Omaha Beach towards San Lo, mm-hmm. and you get a, I mean, a, a hypothetical situation of two hills opposite each other and an American artillery unit setting up and a German unit, artillery unit setting up, the, the advantage the Germans have is they have pre-ranged all the hills in the area of the previous few weeks, and they can just turn to the relevant page in their ring bind and no that's hill 102 over there so from this fit from this position here hill 103 we have to fire at 43 degrees so and so and they can direct their fire quicker which means while the americans are setting up their artillery they're under fire from the germans which which inhibits their ability to fire back quicker so is it with with i know the eastern front is very different because of course given the scale of things neither side has mapped out more you're doing it on the fly until you get till you mm-hmm. until you're in a static position but is there a, a simple case of that whoever gets into action with the most first has an advantage very much so that's where i think i really have to stress especially radios radios coordination strength of office like another factor coming here is strength of officer corps of uh, the soviet officer corps was one already horribly overstretched as part of the expansion of the soviet army um they're badly under trained they don't have the combat experience the germans have. like one factor here is a lot of the senior german officers have world war one combat combat experience you know we uh, oftentimes the youth of the soviet officers is cited as a pattern Forward. But in reality, the fact of the matter is the Germans are coming into this war with a lot of their senior men having experience in a peer-peer conflict, including yeah. hauling an artillery on the fly. Well, and, the, is, and the Russians or the Soviets, by contrast, with their purges, are in fact lacking in officers with, oh, yeah. with ability because they've all gone. And another question I want to just bring up on because mm-hmm. um, uh, Ian Carr, I think, is what ground attack aircraft will have also impacted the effectiveness of both forces because in your four things there, the shells, the, 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 the guns, the, uh, the mm-hmm. communication, um, ground, aircraft and, and what they can do is, I mean, it's hard to then, how many more factors do you bring into this discussion? But just, yeah. to, just to address, if you'd like to address that that for a, for a second, that'd be quite cool. So I'm not quite an aircraft specialist. Um, I've done some, I've, I've, looked, I've looked into them. Um, I think a big problem with ground attack aircraft is that ground attack, there's a lot of reading the future into the past. Um, ground attack aircraft, I mean, they were important, but the fact of the matter is, you look at, for example, the, the Soviets are always talk about how in 1941 they lost because they're fighting our German control. Guys. If you actually look at the number of German aircraft flying in those skies compared to the density of forces on the ground, it doesn't line up. Um, aircraft is often used as an excuse by officers on both sides as to why they lost. And even if you look at 19, 1944, for example, now when the Soviets are controlling the skies, it's still the impact is nowhere near commensurate to the actual numbers of aircraft in the sky. Because in part, if you think about it, when we're talking about directing violence, each, an artillery piece, for the most part, is if that's a math equation. It's someone behind the lines does a bit of math and he pulls a lanyard and the shell fires. And so you don't, and this, and this is really important because combat, so one of the best measures, one of the most, one of the most instructive things about how combat works was some excellent work done in psychological research done by the U.S. Army in the 1970s, which basically found that combat stress reduces efficiency by 90%. In the land, in which is why, you know, in the land of the blind men, the man with the slightly functional eyes can. And so when you look at ground attack aircraft, now that is still a 500 pound bomb is a very significant piece of explosive to put on the enemy. If it hits, that is going to be a very significant event. And so I don't want to discount ground attack aircraft and they could have a very disproportionate effect when they hit. The problem is just that compared to given the amount of explosive they're actually putting on the ground, the actual efficiency is a lot lower than you'd expect because these are men, they're, died, they're one, flying very quickly, two, under the incredible stress of combat, and so their just efficiency just com- goes completely out the window. And there's also the coordination effect. Um, it's easier to coordinate artillery with units on the ground than it is to do aircraft. You can do it to a degree. You know, the, the Americans really started getting pretty good at it. But as I said before, I mean, there's a reason why even when the Germ- even when the Americans li- even they went how many thousands of strategic bombers did they line up for the breakthrough attempt where they just were gonna just pound a path uh, just pound a path through the German lines like even then you still had several days of severe fighting compared to the sheer amount of explosive dropped. 
and, I, and I'm guessing that we people like myself and some people watching have very much an ETO and Pacific Theatre of Operations perception of the amount of aircraft being available to either side because we're mm-hmm. thinking of things like um, the Pacific Theatre in Wajima or we're thinking of Normandy, we're thinking of anything where, you know, the ratio, I mean, on, on D-Day, for example, it's, what is it, 156,000 men on landing and there are 11,000 air sorties by the Allies. Mm-hmm. So that's 10%. Uh, one for every 10 people on the ground, there's one aircraft in the sky. Now, I can't imagine when you get to things like Kursk, it's anything like that ratio. No, and even when you look at Kursk, you know, because we've often, I think a lot of the impressions of air support has, you know, this kind of all destroying force. Even if you look at Kursk, you know, there's the constant narrative of Kursk was, especially at Prokhorovka, it's all about the shifting control of who's in the air at that time. So, first it's the German sorties, then there's the Soviet sorties, then it's the German sorties again. Well, if you actually look at the data, very few tanks are being knocked out by air support. In fact, it's actually extremely difficult to find tanks being knocked out by these ground attack sorties. I mean, I'm yeah. certain it's not it's an advantage, and especially if you can have them in from a psychological standpoint. Especially if you look at 1940, when troops aren't yet used to, to air attack, they can be psychologically paralyzing, especially against artillery lines. But uh, it's, yeah. it's just... It's, it's, it's a lot harder. We just we don't we don't really know what we know as the effectiveness of air power, and it's one of these areas where it's extremely difficult because a lot of our current version of air power has been read back into it. And this is kind of an important thing to remember: yeah. is as always that just because something was incredibly effective in the 1980s doesn't mean it was that it was that that level of effectiveness in the 1940s. I was reading a thing on a forum just yesterday, or say Facebook discussion about why basically Allied Bomber Command and American Eight, Eight Air Force, whatever, in the World War II weren't held more accountable for their failure to hit targets. I mean, I'm simplifying, but it's like mm-hmm. you're, you're expecting aircraft to do things they can do today with precision that actually wasn't possible back in World yeah. War II, even towards the end of 1945. You know, the force of bombers flying at 15,000 feet over a target, getting their bombs on that target was still... Very, very difficult. Where if you've got something that I've done a bit of firing of 25 mm-hmm. pounders in my day, you know, with a 20, not just blank ammunition, but I know enough about 25 pounders. If you set a 25 pounder up and you have a target a mile and a half away, you can kind of, with with yeah. math and, and not, you can kind of hit it. You can hit it kind of first time because it's, it, you know what you're doing. Aircraft is much more, pun intended, hit and miss. Yeah. And I mean, even, good Lord, they couldn't. Even if you look at the 80s, I mean, before the advent of laser, before the advantage of laser guided bombing, if you look and this is kind of what this, you know, what especially if you, if we've seen in Syria with the Russian air campaign there, if you don't have guided weapons, even then, even, you know, a whole two generations later, it's still not going to hit what you're aiming at. Yeah. All right. So, to kind of, so pull back. So. Kind of this is this is really delving into the question of safety. Basically, uh, as I know it's strange to talk about safe violence, but there's a big difference is if you're inflicting your violence from behind the lines by pulling a lanyard versus if you're having to ask the infantry or even the tanks to do it. Because once again, not only they're infantry and tanks, not only they're doing it under combat stress, so they're less efficient, but more importantly, they're having to do, they're having to do it by exposing themselves. You know, if you want if you want infantry to inflict violence on the attack, you have to ask them to get out of their positions and push towards the enemy to flush them out of cover. That means risking your men. That means risking your men. And so, as the slide goes, either you ask the artillery to do it, or you ask the infantry and tanks to do it. And so this is kind of where I really start adding into, because this is kind of the data that I was adding, which is that I took a look at Isayev's ratio, Isayev's data, and I decided to see, all right, what is the ratio of munitions being consumed? Basically, I, I didn't measure the actual bullet. I measured the, like basically the tons of bullets, as in the actual the bullet casing and all, versus the tons of shell being thrown into the enemy. This is a ratio of, you know, to what degree they're asking the infantry to do the job versus the artillery to do the job. And you look at the Germans, for example, here are the ratios. 1 to 12 in 1942, 1 to, 19, 1 to 14 in 1943, 1 to 18 in 1944 compared to the Soviets, 1 to 8 in 1942, 1 to 10 in 1943, 1 to 12 in 1944, and 1 to 14 in 1945. So at every phase in the war, the Germans, the Soviets are having about a 50% higher ratio of infantry of, in, of infantry munitions to Soviet, to, to artillery munitions than the Germans. 
Mind you, some of this is because the Germans are also firing. The Germans are also, they're firing more artillery and they're firing more bullets. But I think this is kind of an important ratio to keep in mind. The Soviets are asking their infantry to do a lot here. And that is produced, well, that produces casualties. That produces a lot of casualties. And it also produces disproportionately large casualties because artillery has a significantly outsized uh, suppressive effect on, on enemy forces. And so not only so when the Germans are firing more artillery, not only are they firing more artillery, not, not only do they have a significantly greater casualty infliction um, potential, they're also they're also suppressing the enemy's violence. They're suppressing the Soviets' ability to inflict violence in return along the infantry firefight than, for example, than what the Soviets are doing to the German infantry. So not only are the Soviet infantry, not only are those German machine guns not being suppressed, they're also having to do so under significant artillery fire. And as kind of a hilariously, <laughs> hilarious counterexample with the Americans, uh, from Normandy to May 1945, they're at a 1 to 42 ratio. As I said, Mama G and Daddy Ford didn't raise no wind. Because yeah. This is when this is something that has to be stressed, because this is a, this is one of my biggest frustrations with Band of Brothers. Because as we talked about the start, in terms of what's depicted on screen, when we depict World War II on screen, it's men shooting at each other. In Band of Brothers, I think friendly artillery is depicted in Band of Brothers maybe once or twice. When in reality, the the especially the Americans, but also the British and the British not too far behind, the Americans and the British push the Germans, break into Germany under the weight of crushing artillery fire, incredible coordination. I mean, the American coordination with the radios, one of the most lethal force multipliers the Americans had was pushing a radio down to every platoon. I mean, that meant that they could get, as we say before, that kind of that first firing, you know, whoever shoots first has a tendency to win. Well, it's not just a matter of pre-registering. It's also a matter of who can get in the fire mission into their side the quickest. And when you have a radio down in every platoon, that means that you can catch, if that German company is massing in the open for a counterattack, you can get artillery on them a lot faster than that company can get artillery onto you when they spot. Hmm. So That's an amazing statistic. I'm still, I know I saw that in the, in the fact you sent the PowerPoint, and I'm still reeling in exactly what that means. That is, is absolutely astonishing. I mean, I knew the power of the artillery bombardments the Allies could bring to bear in 44 and 45, but seeing it in that in that cold, hard, data-driven, but is is really fascinating. Yeah, it's it's why I mean we go into World War. You know, we even in 1944, our armies are still significantly less experienced than the Germans. But one of our abilities to outfight them, to push them back, to break their units, it comes down to artillery. It comes down to the ability to inflict violence, to coordinate that violence well, to qu get it on target quickly, and to inflict an incredible amount of it. Hmm. So, as I said before, kind of the why does this matter? Basically, as kind of a summary, the Soviets are having to accomplish much more of their fighting in a manner which was their manpower. They are at a deficit in suppressive capabilities, and this is important because they're just they're burning through infantry. I, I use an example here: 85 to 90 percent of losses in peer-to-peer -peer combat during the 20th century, including World War II, 85 to 90 percent are being taken by the frontline combat arms, the engineers and the artillery. Is why, for example, you look at tank divisions. Tank divisions take almost all their casualties within the mountain. In, within the mountain, in. Um, it's also why, for example, the Finns. The Finns, when they were developing, when they were creating the rules for who got to wear the combat, you know, the frontline combat medal, the frontline combat service medal of World War II, they actually there was an intense debate about whether to extend it even to anti-tank gunners because of who was actually taking the losses here. Now, my question is going to be to now, mm -hmm. Sasha, is is that the that American ratio? You could make the point is it goes that way because the, the Allies have the ability to put their money into artillery. They've got that strength. They've got the material. Is it not? Is it possible the Soviets have actually realized that that they are having to send more men in, but they have not yet got the ability to change the ratio? They want to, but they can't. Because there's two ways. Is it is it that they are? Um, stuck with the mentality of infantry being their preferred method or is it because they have they can yeah so they can't actually catch up in terms of production so they're having to use infantry they can like catch that. up they, they can catch up um that's the big thing is you know the germans uh, sorry of the soviets it, it is when we talk about the purges it is important to remember that the soviet army the foundation of the soviet army is actually bruzlov and his staff if you look at who actually founds the RKKA, who actually leads it, who actually forms kind of the brain trust of the RKKA, even in the Civil War and into the Russo-Polish War, the brain trust of the RKKA, the 
the Soviet the Soviet Red Army is for the most part it is Brusilov and his old Eighth Army staff which followed him up to command the southwestern front. So they all the initial the people who trained the men who then fought World War II or the people who trained the men who fought World War II or the people who trained the men who trained the men who fought World War II all have the experience of fighting under a crushing German artillery superiority in 1914, 1915, and 1916. They all remember this very well. They don't want to do this. The problem is difficulties in the ramp-up of rearmament. The problem is Tukhachevsky. Um, Tukhachevsky was very much, you know, he's often cited as kind of the lost martyr, but Tukhachevsky very much, he, if you actually read a lot of his writing on deep battle, it's very much, it's, it sounds at times like a kid pushing around his toys going vroom, vroom. You know, he is someone who very much fell into that parade trap. It is problems the Soviet is in his problems with the Soviet war economy. These generals know very well that they're fighting under a crushing a critical deficiency, but they have no choice. They have you you fight with them. You fight with what you have. It's no different what the Entente had to do in 1915. Um, the the Russians were fighting under a shell deficiency. The French, who carried most of the fighting in 1915, were fighting under a critical heavy artillery deficiency and a shell deficiency. It's just well, the enemy is there and you have to fight him. Um, so, all right. So to continue to the next line, um, beyond losses, operational inflexibility. And this is kind of, I want to tie back into those, you know, when I talked about the Red God of War and Steel Wind, I want to tie back into those narratives, which is that these crushing opening bombardments, these heavily intricate, in these intricately planned bombardments that launch operations, they're not a strength. Zebecki read these as having continued the cutting edge artillery techniques of the late World War I era Germans. These aren't a strength, they're a weakness. If you have the shells, if you have the radios, if you have the coordination, the ideal form of artillery support is just to pass it off to the observers, is to have is to have these artillery, is to have this artillery support on the fly to organically respond to situations as they develop. The problem is the Soviets can't do it. They have the Soviets, they don't have the shells to do it, but also they don't really have they don't have the manpower to do it because of you know because of problems with the educational system and also because they lost so many officers and so many trained people in 1941 during the collapse of the units. As I mentioned before, you don't take heavy artillery um, casualties until units start collapsing. The problem is when units get pocketed, when units get destroyed, you're losing a lot of trained people. It's ghoulish to say, but you can replace an infantryman pretty quickly. Hand him a rifle, mm -hmm. put him into the unit, get him some training on the ground. You can bolt your units back out pretty quickly. You can't replace staff. You can't do that with staff officers. You can't replace that with higher level officers. You can't do that with observers. You can't do that with the, um, with the trained gunners. And this is going to be a major problem as the war continues. Which, as kind of glance, which has kind of glance discussed in his later books, and kind of this is a quotation from an email email conversation with him um, from uh, from last year, which was as he's noted in his later books. Simply put, the Soviet army just really struggles with target acquisition and fire direction, and it results in some very operationally inflexible forces because the Germans. Oftentimes, they're keyed into by what the Soviets are doing. The ranging shots are coming in. They know where the offensive is going to land. Oftentimes, they pull their men back about a mile into the second line. They let the bombardment fall. They reoccupy their line. And this, this is even happening into 1945. If you look at the offensive on Sea Level Heights, the, the Soviet artillery bombardment completely fails. The Germans are able to withdraw in time to their second line positions and really force the Soviets to fight them on their second line positions to force them to commit the tanks too early and take some really brutal losses without the artillery fire support they needed. And I think what's really striking about this is if you actually look at Soviet artillery use, at times they're using a lot of these in direct fire. You know, even into 1944, they're using a lot of their guns in direct fire. They're using a lot of their guns as they would have been used in 1914 or 1915. It's a real step back, unfortunately. And, and this is highlighting the floor with the comparison of tube numbers, as you said earlier, exactly. is only telling a very small part of the story. And depending on the context in which the story and the documentary maker, the YouTuber is using it, it can, it might be actually giving a warped uh, impression of exactly mm -hmm. what the battlefield uh, is. Exactly. It is the, it is telling as it here, these are, it's telling half the story basically, which is because the, these artillery bombardments until you have very mobile guns, are very hard, you know, 
Well, actually, I would actually note, um, so someone had mentioned, I made a comment about how it's very difficult for any army to obtain the kind of the sensor shooter model until you have mobile guns and good communications. I'd know that the Entente in 1919 actually is doing that. The Entente in 1918, because they have excellent maps, because they have excellent, they have such incredibly well-trained and experienced artillery corps, and because they have all those guns, and because, especially in the case of the French, they've motorized the guns, they can actually, by that point, by 1918, during the mobile fighting of 1918, they're actually calling it, they, they're calling in bombardments, they're planning even very, even very complex things like a, like a dense rolling barrage, they can get that going on a couple hours notice. They can get even sensor shooter models. They can get guns on target very quickly. Like this is one of what I really need to stress. Like a lot of this comes with experience. Well, it comes with communications technologies. Commun- comes, but also it just comes with experience in terms of staff officers, in terms of gunners. And so, kind of as a, as so as a kind of a summary for this part, the imagery of the heavy initial bombardments these aren't false. The Soviets are indeed. If the bombardment lands, if the bombardment catches the Germans before they can withdraw to the second line they are going to create havoc and they can even break through. And this is where, and this is where kind of you get that very boomer bust aspect as Glance has gone into of the Soviet offensives. Either they break through, their tanks are inserted and it's a major disaster or the offensive just, it just bounces off. The, it, you get another Rezhev. The Soviet units just bounce off the German lines and it's an utter bloodbath. This is where that kind of very boomer bust aspect comes in. It just, it all comes down to whether the initial bombardment succeeds. And, and when we're talking about forces, the size the Soviets are deploying to kind of operate on a 50-50 kind of it might work or it might not work is not a very efficient way of waging war. I mean, no. it, 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 it could work, but it might not work. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's really fascinating. Yeah, it's, as, as I said before, it's when I, there's a classic Chris Rock line, you know, to kind of paraphrase a classic Chris Rock line, like if you have a major tank superiority, a major manpower superiority, shock, supra, operational surprise and everything else, you're supposed to win. Yeah. You know, you are not supposed to be taking these levels of casualties. You're not supposed to be seeing these these on um, this lack of success. This is not supposed to be happening. Something has gone deeply wrong. And it's not and things, it's not as the Soviets are callous or intentionally doing so, as you mentioned, it's just they don't have a choice. They they not only had difficulty getting trained manpower up and running, they lost so much of it. And as we'll go into in part four, they lost a lot of their capacity to produce shells. Oh, and also, so, I, so there's a note here, Soviet doctrine was to use their 76 millimeter divisional artillery in a dual purpose anti-tank role. That's actually not insane. Um, using artillery, because a lot of anti-tank work is about concentration of guns, um, a 76 millimeter, if you, if your tank gets hit with a 76 millimeter HE shell, it's going to have a bad, um, either, you know, just the concussion alone is going to severely impact the crew's ability to function, slash will likely render it combat ineffective. So that's actually, the 76 millimeter gun, it's very light, but its ability to be used in an anti-tank role is actually a major advantage in terms of just having, because a lot of anti-tank work basically just comes down to how many guns you can mass versus how many tanks can you can mass. Yeah, okay. So part four, behind Soviet lines. So let's go back to that flow chart. So if you look at this flow chart, let's you know, c- come back to it. What are, the four, what are the four parts of effective rounds on target? Heavy industry? chemical industry, educational system, electronics industry. So next. So part one, here's where the Soviets, this is where we've often, a lot of our image of this crushing Soviet material superiority comes from. The Soviet heavy industry is well developed. Um, they go through this massive rearmament beginning, there's this war, there's the Soviet war scare from 1926 to 1927. And following it, the Soviet army's transport. The Soviet army, of the 1920s is a cavalry infantry, it's a militia force. It's it's, it's explicitly designed as a militia force to avoid what they were, what they had always feared of was Bonapartism. Um, Napoleon Bonaparte from many revolutionary movements is the classic boogeyman. It's the classic threat that the army takes over. And so they deliberately designed a militia force. There's a brain trust behind it. The brain trust in Moscow that's emerging, all this and kind of these new operational thinkers, they have an idea for a modern army, but the force itself is a militia. There's this massive transformation and modernization wave beginning in 1927, which then gets led by Tukhachevsky. The problem is that this is heavily defined by tangibles. They have the world's largest tank fleet, but they're not really investing in spare parts. They have a massive fleet of planes, but they're not investing in radios. So they basically, they expand very quickly, but what they're expanding is they're expanding what they already have on the ground, what's easy to expand. It's a lot easier to produce a lot more steel and it's a lot to produce a lot more steel and to produce a lot more just guns 
things made of steel, that's the easiest thing to expand. And so those are the sectors which are expanded first. What's the problem? The chemical industry. This is critical. The chemical industry, as I see, as I point out here, these are the this is what the giant feet of clay are. As I noted before at the beginning, the artillery piece is not the weapon. The shell is the weapon. Shells require a massive amount of explosive, both as propellants and as explosive filler. And also chemical industry, industries, they're incredibly complex. There's a reason why the second industrial revolution, the chemical revolution, happens 40 years after the beginning of the first industrial revolution, the steel revolution, and the 1840s. You need an educated workforce. You need an immense amount of supporting industries. If you don't have nitrate fixation systems, you have the, the, the Haber process, the nitrate, the nitrogen fixing process the Germans developed. That's an incredibly complex industry to build, and it's critical. Because if you don't have nitrates, you don't have explosives. You know, um, from a Haber and this Haber process is what allows Germany to wage war in the 20th century because Germany does not have access to nitrates. Haber's process, along for the artificial creation of nitrogen, is what allows Germany to remain in World War I, past halfway through 1915 when the access to the Chilean nitrates gets cut off, and what allows them to fight World War II. So not only are the Soviet chemical industries, not only they, they weren't underinvested in, but they weren't, once again, they're not tangible in the same way that the heavy industries are. So they lag behind in terms of focus of investment. Not only do they significantly lag behind, but they're also heavily concentrated in Ukraine, the traditional industrial heartland of the Soviet Union. These factories can't be moved. And this is, to me, one of the critical impacts of Barbarossa. You know, you can move a tank factory, you can move a plane factory, you can move those machine tools. You can't remove these explosives producing industries. When Barbarossa occurs, two thirds of the Soviets already limited chemical production capacity is lost. That is two thirds of the ability at the time of the Soviets to produce violence. Is what How much of this, Sasha, is also due to the fact that the way Stalin and, and the, the, other, the others are, are manipulating, and it's been come up in the conversation, and, mm -hmm. a, a largely uneducated population uh, of different languages across the entire Soviet Union. Showing people lots of big guns is a really instant way of suggesting you've got this military power. Explaining that you've got the ability to produce chemicals to make explosives is something that not every person within the empire is going to understand that. It's not mm -hmm. as sexy as just saying, look at all our guns. So you can understand they're being they're caught in their own uh, propaganda um, uh, process as well. Mm -hmm. in the, it's an, As you say, it's it, it, not only is it physically the easiest thing to produce, because We've been making steel for centuries now. You know, you, you can just make steel, but it's also yeah, fulfilling this this impression that you are arming yourself with a modern army because oh, look, we've got X number of guns. It's so it's, it's a mm -hmm. it's a trap that they're falling into themselves, but they're kind of they they're willingly they're willingly moving and falling into their own trap in a sense. So the interesting thing with the Politburo is this is something that's a lot of like a very recent research, like a lot of the more recent research past 1990 of the Politburo has revealed. They believe their own stories. You know, if you look at the records of the Politburo meetings, we often thought, oh, this is just propaganda. Oh, they don't actually believe they're surrounded by enemies. This is just an excuse for a purge. If you actually look at, and I'm, I'm, I'm blanking, Arch Getty. If you look at Arch Getty's work on, the, on Stalin and the Politburo at the time, they believed this. You know, this is, um, they, they really believe their own stories. So Stalin, you have to remember, these men, you know, Tukhachevsky was 40. Stalin, I think at the time, he was, what, in his early 30s when he was fighting during the, during the, the Russian Civil War and the Soviet-Polish Wars? And these were young men. They don't know what they did. They don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And so the, I... I genuinely think that they believed that they saw these parades and that they believed they were believing their own propaganda because it wasn't propaganda to them. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, a fa it's a fascinating element of the early Soviet Union because our initial, and this is actually something that, uh, this is a, um, a mistake that we often, uh, oftentimes we make in the, in the West. Even today, for example, when we look at, for example, Chinese propaganda or how the Iranians discuss, we have this belief, oh, they don't actually believe this. No, this is just what they're selling to justify their action. But oftentimes, these regimes, they believe what they are selling. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So I'm going to continue. So And so the kind of, just, just a note here, this is one of the biggest impacts of Barbarossa. The loss of the chemical industries in Ukraine cuts by two-thirds the ability of the Soviets to produce violence. Because violence is chemicals, it's chemicals and explosives propelling steel. 
So, uh, so next, um, and that is a, that is a, that's a, that is really significant. That again is why the little takeaways are, uh, from this, you know, two thirds their ability lost it, but it, it, that's that's massive. Yeah. And so the end result is lend lease to the rescue. So this is a quote from Georgi Zukov. You know, we didn't have explosive gunpowder. We didn't have anything to charge our rifle cartridges with. The Americans really saved us with their gunpowder and explosives. This is this was cited in 1963 within the within the Politburo Central Committee. And it's a very revealing quote, because this is the time they were talking about, it was a discussion in the Politburo. This was around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. That sheet's a record from discussion about the crisis. And they're talking about lend lease and everything. They're talking about how the Americans always use them. And this was a quote that was brought up. And it's really important. Because today, especially because of the hard, it's, it, there's been kind of a rise of leftist politics, um, a, really, a very hard leftist politics. And the Soviet Union has become a critical part, not only of pushing back on less blonde here Nazi fanboys online, over there's a lot, you know, even within the military historic community for a long time, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of Nazi fetishism of the amazing capabilities of the German army, but also from a political standpoint, you know, World War II is communism's greatest triumph. It is the legitimating, the legitimizing, as, the legitimizing factor for communism as a worldwide political ideology, is World War II. It is the triumph of the USSR. It's what base, that's what its legitimacy is built on for the next- Which essentially is Sean McMeekin's point, who we had on yesterday. For those, if you haven't seen that show yet, folks, the Sean McMeekin show yesterday with about his book, Stalin's War, is essentially saying that, mm -hmm. that, that, that World War II, the only true victors was Stalin and in turn communism because we didn't completely defeat communism for the 40 years. Well, arguably you haven't defeated, we defeated it in Europe. But uh, um, so, yeah, that's if you haven't seen that show, folks, go back and watch that. But but get, getting yeah. back to lend -Lease. And so this is what, and this is why lend -Lease is such a politically kind of, this is such a, why it's such a politically hot topic is because lend -Lease is oftentimes saying, oh no, you know, we won the war. You know, there's always a fight between the Americans, between the Americans and the Russians over who won the war, and the Soviet in the in the Soviets will Russians today. Well, he's, oh, lend least it was important. There's a m more minor fact, you know, and even and online as well. Is it's often used to downplay lend lease. Lend -Lease was well, Sean said that very thing yesterday. Is that now when Western historians are are saying just how much stuff was sent to the Soviet Union by lend lease, and not just the shells. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was not about the butter and the and the borscht that was sent out there and the spam that was sent out there. And, and as you say, the, the Russian idea now is no, 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 lend lease was just, it just, it was the cherry on the cake. We would say in English, it didn't actually, it didn't, it, we, we were doing all right without it. It just, it gave us a bit of an extra. It gave mm -hmm. us, yeah. And you know, that, that last bit of data you're getting to now is, is, yeah. is really significant again. Half as a kind of to read it kind of from the bottom up to the top. 55%, this is from Andrej Balish. Andrej Balish's um, excellent article, Explosives Production in the, in the USSR. At times, I've seen numbers of it being a third, a third, kind of less less detailed studies found it to be about a third. Uh, Balish found it to be 55%. So more than half of Soviet explosives, so more than half of the Soviet capacity for violence originates with lend -Lease chemicals. I mean, I mean, I mean, just sort of hold the show there, folks, because, you know, this has been a trope in recent years is that you can't mention... The, the success of the Allies in the Western Front without acknowledging that the figures are for every German killed in the Western Front, there are seven killed in the Eastern Front, there for every tank in the Western Front. And all of that is true to some extent. But what, what this data is saying is that over 50% of, of the, 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 the debt, well, the shells that are being fired by the service have actually come from the West. So, yes, it's a really interesting statistic that is proving that we can claim part of that. They can't claim any of our victory. <laughs> we can claim a bit of theirs if I'm using we as referring mm -hmm. to the Westerners, the Americans, yeah. the British. So, um, yeah, really fascinating stuff. And it's also and it's critically important for understanding World War II. I think there's a lot of um, thanks to a lot of stupid Nazi fanboy alternate history from like their their earlier period. There's a lot of an emphasis to say, oh, the Germans were always doomed. No, they were not. But as you point here, if lend lease does not occur, if those chemicals do not flow, the Soviets cannot fight a war. The Soviets, without those lend lease chemicals, the Soviets are fighting basically roughly similarly to how the Chinese were fighting the Japanese. Yeah. You know, they cannot, they are not, they do not have the capacity to truly wage a modern war. And so the question becomes without, so without that lend lease, if the Soviets fall in 1942, which without those explosives, they do, because they will not have the shells, they will not have the bullets they need to properly fight, things are getting a lot more complex. Um, and this kind of falls into, kind of, kind of pull it from back up, back upwards, because the choke, as I mentioned before, and kind of to reiterate, the choke point in the Soviet ability to fight is ammunition. They have plenty of tubes, they have plenty of tanks, they have plenty of machine guns, but they have very little to shoot through those tools. Because as before, the tank is not the weapon, shell is yeah. the weapon. 
And this is a major reason why the 1941 Moscow counteroffensive stalls out. There's an initial period of great success because the Germans are basically all, they're all strong out. You know, the Germans are all strong out. They're being caught in the process of their own offensive. So the counteroffensive succeed, has a massive initial success as it kind of catches the Germans strong out. And then the offensive just completely stalls out as the lines re-solidify. Because the Soviets, once it starts becoming more of a positional fight, once it starts becoming really, it becomes a fight for the villages in the middle of the winter. It becomes a fight for heat for these villages. And once it becomes that fight for the villages, the Soviets just don't have the shells to break through, which is why you see, for example, you see the formation of these pockets, which they can't reduce because they don't have the shells. And so the Soviets end up spending the first half of 1942 bleeding their army dry in this continual counteroffensive. That are being it's continually being pushed because they think they have that opening after 1941. But that 1941 period, it was this bleeding period when the Germans were strung out. And this period of bleeding out is what leads to the just enormously successful German breakthrough in the south along the southern aspect of the front in 1942, because the Soviet units have been badly attrited. It culminates in the disaster at Kharkov, and it's only now the Germans have are able to just punch through these weakened forces, including as well Sevastopol. This is a big factor here. When you look at the Sevastopol offensive, Sevastopol offensive, the classic narrative is that of material schlocked. But the problem is, if you actually look at the positional battles, the Germans, when they want to push forward in Leningrad, the Germans move forward essentially at will in these positional fights. And Sevastopol, in this incredibly dense eight mile long battlefront, they're able to move through, I don't say necessarily at will, but they're having an immense amount of success in these positional battles because it's them that they have, that have the artillery, not the Soviets. Yeah. And as the next slide. Yeah, just sort of out. There we go. And as a side note, I kind of uh, this, this will, I'll I'll do this relatively briefly, but it's also important to know that even as the Soviets were having troubles, the initial underinvestment are in shell production and also the loss of their chemical industries and also all these other issues, the Germans, in part, this is one of the rare times where Hitler's invention actually intervention actually worked out because of his World War I experience, the initial wartime German economy. War, war industries are focused on two things, planes and shells. About 70% of German resources are allocated to either ammunition or airplane production, which means that the Germans are able to go into, once 1940 starts up and then leading to the Eastern Front, they're able to go into this conflict with a heavy initial investment into, the, into just a general pool of violence. And it is this pool of violence that they're then able to direct and it gives them a major advantage. So, this kind of this is playing back into we've already discussed heavily, fairly heavily communications. And so we've already covered most of the stuff on this point, but you know, radios and the three R's, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. It's just there's a major German advantage in both the ability of the communication tools and also educational investment. Because you can't, you just you can't turn around. You can't build an electronics industry from scratch. And also I think the Soviets really neglected the electronics industries. Um, that's another thing where they just they didn't know what they didn't know. So you see this is a major problem with Soviet aircraft. So it'd be a tank co cooperation. This is a huge, 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 huge force multiplier for the Germans. It's just significantly more radios. They can coordinate much better. And as finally, as I mentioned before, it's the parade trap. And this is something kind of, this is where it really gets more widely useful. This is a parade, this is a trap that we constantly fall into. We just fell into this with the Afghan National Army. We fell into this a couple of years earlier with the Iraqi National Army when we were when we were rebuilding them. We made the same mistake with the South Vietnamese militaries, um, and a lot of the a lot of the Arab states made this mistake in the 60s and 70s, which is why you ended up having you know if you look at the uh, Seven Days War and the Yom Kippur War, you have these massive force, force differentials. You made some major mistakes in force construction. It's the parade trap. Just because you're parading mile upon mile upon mile upon mile of tanks down Red Square doesn't mean you actually have the capacity to inflict violence. That is just the bandwidth. And so you have to, and this is just something I have stressed the audience, when you're reading history books moving forward or when you're reading modern defense policy, keep in mind, the plane is not the weapon. The pilot guiding the plane to drop the bomb is the weapon. It's, yeah. Yeah, no, all good stuff. So this kind of leads into the conclusion, uh, as my as my sidebar, why you're now significantly better equipped to annoy historians. I say annoy historians because a lot of this, a lot of the problem with data history is that it's just, it's very gritty. It's boring, it's gritty, a lot of it is stitch counting. A lot of historians, military history already is looked down upon within academia, even within, like they look down on stitch counting. Well, the problem is stitch counting matters. Measuring chemical production matters. 
measuring the ability to produce shells matters. Measuring the amount of radios matters. And kind of as a quick summary, as a summary before, the tangibility trap. You can, as I've stressed it throughout the entire talk, it's very easy to fall into this problem. Equipment is just a delivery. It is a delivery system for the real weapon. Delivering the weapon requires an immense, um, it's an immense combination of state capacities. Every single sector of society contributes to getting that shell on target. Producing it, it takes a long time. You can't build a modern military and a modern military industry within 10 years. The United States could do it, but that's because we had all the underlying industries built. If you don't have those underlying industries built, if you're coming from scratch, it takes an immense amount of time. And so when you're reading accounts, when you're reading history, focus, think about the capacity for violence. Look beyond the numbers and really think about, okay, what do these numbers actually mean in terms of the actual ability to produce results? Same thing goes for historians. When you're writing your books, when you're reading your sources, think about what is the actual capacity here. Whenever possible, look for ammunition counts. Ammunition counts are critical. And kind of as a final point, and this is also, you know, um, from, from the next slide, um, this is something kind of for, for the audience here and for historians, the rise of online history, especially kind of there's been a boom in scanning of archival scanning over the past 10 years, and it has opened a whole new world of information especially for World War I. I do, most of my work is actually in World War I. None of what I can do, what, none of what I do could have been possible 10 years ago. And now I was able to create a divisional casualty track. As in per day, the number of dead a division was facing per, per day. And that's all been allowed because of the, just the boom in modern information. There's, the, there's a wealth of information. And this means, not only does it mean that you have a whole new world to explore, it also means we need to be more critical of sources. So many sources, basically, there's this constant recycling of narratives. Yeah. We're, you know, and it's not, it's not mean-spirited, it's not wrong, it's just you don't know what you don't know. And so there's end up being this constant citation of, of the respectable histories, citing respectable histories, citing respectable histories. And as a lawyer, you know, as a lawyer, a lot of my work uh, involves using citations or piercing through to citations to say why the other person's use of them is wrong. You have to go back down the chain. Because at times you can basically, you can, you can whitewash, you can, it kind of becomes a laundromat or potentially shaky initial impressions become part of solidified respectable history because we don't know if they were initially well, shaky. This reminds me, Sasha, of those, those books you read where in acknowledgements, the author will say, and I want to thank all my, my friends and colleagues for their help. And you read their names and they're people just like them. They're, they're, they're the same age group with mm -hmm. the same background, with the same general knowledge of things. You think, Where's the where's the artillery geek you've consulted? Where's the guy who's crunched the numbers on so and so? Where's the the the, the uniform guy who knows it? It's it's we are changing. I think the move the world is moving forward a bit. We're understanding the importance of maintenance when it comes to armored vehicles now. In fact, we did a show with Arthur Gulexson a few weeks months ago about the Canadian ability to to um repair their armored vehicles and it was like mm -hmm. a triage system and things like that. so we're, we're starting to understand i think with armor we may be understanding a little bit more with um with aircraft and the, and the skills of pilots and the you know we did our show in the battle of britain week about the importance of all the uh the downing downing system and what have you as being mm -hmm. just as important to the victory as it is the pilots in the aircraft but artillery and the lit and, and logistics which isn't logistic artillery isn't part of logistics they will be for, they'll be the last ones to be addressed because artillery except if you're ex-artillery is not sexy it, it, yeah. tanks come first infantry machine guns come first but i think it is really really important to, to for historians to broaden out their list of contacts and not just look at the same people who passed the same course at the same war studies university as they did, who read the same materials, who are using the same um, texts to formulate <laughs> their ideas. There, as you say, there is a, a world of people out there on the internet who've micro-dived into whichever aspect they have, and maybe they haven't got a PhD, maybe they haven't got a published book behind their name, but they have focused on something specific. I'm thinking about people like um, Nick Bard and his MG42 interest. Uh, Jonathan Ware, he assess history on Twitter, mm -hmm. who is an absolute mine of information about you know, things like Operation Goodwood and Blue Coat. And I mean, and some of those people are getting recognition by historians, but I think there's always more historians can do to 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 broaden out their their um where they get their data and their information from and i think kind of in this also is really important to stress data um this is kind of i think there's there's a natural 
I think there's a natural tendency and a natural understandable uh, and a natural understandable tendency to because of the academic disdain for military history. There's a natural tendency to go into narratives, to want to write arguments. There, there, to almost it's almost this internal it's almost this internalized fear that we have to to become more respectable. Military history has to be more it's best to be more about society. It has to be more it has to be less gritty, less crunchy, less down to the numbers. And I'm not saying every not every military history should have a spreadsheet in it. Like I, I'm very acknowledged. I, I do very niche work. I work, I love using Excel. I go into the numbers. I spend I spend hours multiplying numbers of shells by the weight of shells. You know, this is very niche. But so I'm not saying that your work has to focus on it, but it should incorporate it when you're reading into your more general conclusion. A classic example. Um, there was a very good book on the on the Western Front, you know, focusing on the northern sector, and as part of the discussion of Ypres. As part of the uh, as part of the discussion of Ypres, there was of Third Ypres Battle of Passchendaele. Um, one thing it says was, "Oh, the British consumed 19 million shells. And, you know, the Germans had consumed X number of trains of shells, and the British had consumed probably 19 million shells." And it was used to discuss how Ypres had been like yet another battle where the British fight with crushing material superiority and still end up not achieving what they want. The thing is, you could actually find out the number of shells from the statistics of the military effort. It's actually lower. And you could actually, if you really went into the gritty numbers of multiplying the numbers of trains of, of train or ammunition trains by the number of shells they contained, which it's a long story, but the end result was Passchendaele was actually the Germans and the British going blow for blow, firing about the same quantity of shells as each other. And that changes things. That changes, mm -hmm. you know, as we go in the economic history of the World War One, was right about how the Germans faced, you know, the Germans could have never won World War One. They were facing too large of an economic imbalance. Why did they even go to war with such an economic imbalance? Well, actually, in terms of the war, in terms of the war production, in terms of their actual ability to produce war materials, when you really go into the numbers, when you pierce past, past the narratives, when you go past what infantrymen were saying or what generals were saying, to really look at what was on the books, it actually turns out the Germans were matching them. They were matching them punch for punch. And that's important. It's yeah. when you're selling, when you're writing military history, I know you have to, when you're writing within the academia and within the, within the general public, you should still focus on, you, you shouldn't make your work unreadable, but it's always a good thing to check, you know, just check to see what's being, what's bubbling up online to see, is this still true? Is this still confirmed? And if it doesn't, how do I use that? And how, because it's actually a very interesting question. You know, one of the fascinating narrative questions about artillery is why doesn't artillery show up in soldiers' accounts? Why does Band of Brothers only show artillery as a hostile factor? That's a fast for that right there. You know, the soldiers' impression of artillery is a fascinating cultural conversation. That is exactly the kind of work that is perfect for an academic work or for a mass market book. You know, discussing the soldiers' relationships on the battlefield and their own experiences. There's so many interesting social and cultural questions that can emerge from this kind of harder, grittier data work. And this is kind of it's, it's a whole joy, yeah, the thing is, it's, I mean, not not that I'm defending Band of Brothers per se, but although mm -hmm. I kind of am, is that it's, as you said at the beginning, uh, in fact, you quoted, without knowing you quoted it, exactly what while Bill Garnier said to me on one occasion about 10 years mm -hmm. ago when he said, every soldier thinks they're in the muddiest foxhole with the nastiest sergeant major, with the most shells exploding over the hell head, the most t tanks bearing down on them, the most snipers aiming at them he said it's the historian's job to actually put say hang on this unit was facing it worse than this unit here this unit actually was in a softer you know a, a less difficult area compared to this unit here because the the soldier's perspective from that point of view is not necessarily accurate and so therefore band of brothers being from the point of view of those men in the 506 is an accurate version from their point of view, mm -hmm. but it isn't necessarily an accurate version for us, the general audience to take away. This is how wars work. This is how wars work from the point of view of infantrymen within a parachute infantry regiment in airborne operations. But what the problem is, is I always say, when Steven Spielberg made Semi Private Ryan, he didn't know that every single person who ever goes to Omaha Beach ever after that will, to some extent, run through the first 20 minutes of Semi Private Ryan in their head. That's not Spielberg's responsibility. It, it, the, the blame doesn't lie with him. The blame d d lies to equally for the audience assuming that something there being presented via a screen 
is the only way to derive their information, which goes back to what we were saying a minute ago about historians deriving their information from the same set of places that the previous historian who wrote about the subject has drawn their information from. So therefore, you're using the same material. Maybe you're coming up with a slightly different interpretation of it, but you're not changing the narrative. You're not actually going back and looking at something different, which is why what you're doing is so important. But we are going to move on a bit because you do yep. want to show people some pictures of some guns to end up with. People <laughs> say there hasn't been any, any photos of actual bang sticks. We're going to show you a couple of photos of bang so, sticks. Yeah. So as a treat, and uh, so as, so as, 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 right before we do that, I think uh, there's just that classic line I read that, that I had put in below that I think is really important. It's like, it's one of my favorite, it's from one of my favorite jokes, but I think it's also always important to keep in mind, which is Control Tower, I, I think, you know, as the pilot says he's landing, Control Tower, I think we have a problem. Uh, your landing strip's only 200 feet long and three miles wide. Always a question of perspective. There's yeah. always a new way to look at things. So yeah. as a treat, because all of you have now watched through and because YouTube ad revenue goes up as if when you watch through the entire video, here are some equipment photos. Uh, so this, this is the ZIS-3. It's for, it's ZIS is short for factory named and named for Stalin. It's the primary, this is the primary Soviet division. It is their primary artillery. fleet. It's very light. The CIS-3 is basically a, it's an extremely modern carriage. The carriage is incredible. The direct fire capacities for tank work is incredible. Also capable of indirect fire work. But it is, for the most part, it's very much, it is, in my view, the ZIS-3 is the peak kind of development of the old World War I divisional guns so that they go into 1914 with. It's an incredible piece, but it's also, it's a dead end, evolutionarily speaking. Um, because it is, it's just, it's a very light, it's very light. The, the IS-3 is fighting a six kilo, so about a 13 pound shell of the, um, as the name goes, the 25 pounders firing twice the shell. You know, those light shells make a major difference when you're engaging in, in, in indirect fire work, when you're engaging in fire on trenches, that lack of heavy, or head heavy shell has a major impact. Which ties back to your original comment about the ability to inflict violence. This this is inflicting violence, but not 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 to a huge capacity compared to what the enemy is. Yes. So the next one is the this is the 122 millimeter howitzer M1938. This is the other key divisional gun. This is the primary source of, of Soviet divisional um, indirect fire capability, which is important because during kind of during more mobile oh, during more more mobile fighting because of the Soviet problems with um, with their officers because they lose so many officers. They, one, don't have enough officers going into the war. They lose a lot of officers during the major losses of Barbarossa and the subsequent offensive. This is, for the most part, because they, you're not guaranteed to be able to easily access army-level assets. This is the primary source of indirect fire capability in the hands of most Soviet divisions. This is the 122. So this is a gun howitzer. Now you're starting to, you know, this is a significantly heavier piece. This is a core, this is a core level or really it's an army level asset because the red, the red army deletes the core level because of a lack of um, a lack of cores. It's long range, very well suited for counter battery work. The Germans had a lot of respect for this piece because it is an extremely, you know, when it comes again, because the Soviets, I think, made the smart decision to concentrate because they lose so many uh, uh, trained personnel. They start concentrating their trained personnel in certain units for certain capabilities. And so your best Soviet gunners are, are being put into the army level asset. Also, this is also where the Soviets concentrate their trucks. You know, we often talk about how, oh, the Soviets are a truck born for. Not really. Per capita, the Soviets have the same amount of trucks as the Germans. Just the difference is what the Soviets do is a very smart move is they concentrate their land lease truck vehicles, especially towards motorizing their like Bagrat, which is why, for example, Bagration, one of the things that seals the success of Bagration is that there is that they they have this they were able to motorize their army level artillery assets, and so they basically once the initial breakthrough is made, they're able to move through some incredible logistical work. They're able to move this immense siege train through the marshes to seal the to seal the breakthrough and to seal the offense. This is the 152 millimeter howitzer gun, 1937. This is probably the most important high-level Soviet artillery asset. Um, well, same thing before, it's one of the key recipients of, Len of motorization through lend trucks and also lend tractors. And what's interesting is here is actually, it's actually very similar to a lot of American artillery because both the American 155 millimeter, um, the American 155 millimeter gun, which remains the standard American, uh, uh, yeah, the standard American artillery caliber to this day, those guns are all an evolution, all, all from a very, very direct evolutionary line to this original Schneider 155, 152 millimeter piece, which was originally produced for the Russians in 1912. So this Schneider piece becomes the 1917 155 millimeter GPF, a Grand Puissance Pelou, 
it which then becomes the standard of the American heavy artillery piece, which becomes which then gets changed and developed into the long tom, which then be, you know over time and over time and over time. To the point where actually the M77 until about ten years ago, the shell that these 155 millimeter guns were firing was basically the same shell casing as had been used since 1912. Differences in the explosives, differences in the fragmentation, but the actual shell itself, these things, you know, they're all, it's all from the same fodder. Well, essentially we, we reached the, the, the peak of the, the artillery was based around the limitations of human beings. Is there what size yeah. shell can human being pick up? What's what size vehicle, what, what, how heavy are they to be towed behind mm -hmm. the vehicle? Getting those vehicles down regular roads, get them across bridges, so on and so forth, which is why artillery kind of reached its its peak how many decades ago. And apart from the content of the explosives and the ability to sight and see, the actual the, the barrel itself has not really seen any major developments yeah. in in decades. Um, I want to go back to something you said mm -hmm. because we did talk earlier about um, the, the, the 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 shells coming from the USA on lend lease. And, you know, you threw in there about the fact that well, it explosive explosives. Oh, I do want to make, yeah, yeah it's a, that's the more thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's for the uh, most part, it's explosives. And we're talking mm -hmm. now about, you said there about the ability to, to motorize their, their, their artillery and move them about mm -hmm. because that was said, several people on the side by earlier said, it's all very well having artillery, having mobile artillery is a very different factor. And uh, uh, so that's important as well. Another, another, vote for lend lease in the sense mm -hmm. that it's giving them the, the soviets the ability to move these things around now one thing we haven't touched on because i did a little bit of prep for this and i was looking at the the variety the, the in a sense not that many varieties of artillery pieces the soviets used in world war ii especially when you compare with the germans I mean, because the germans mm -hmm. are using french and polish and and all sorts of them even using russian stuff later on so that theoretically should have given the soviets an advantage earlier in that fewer types of artillery fewer types of training, fewer types of shell, fewer types of spare parts. And yet the Germans, now I know in probably in Barbarossa in 41, they're probably using a slightly less variety of, of, of artillery pieces. But I know from their, their trucks, because David Stahl said this, they're using hundreds of varieties of trucks, the Germans. So so this 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 should be an advantage the Soviets have. And yet, as you're, the point you're making is that the Germans are still being able to bring down an, a, 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 an advantage when it comes to artillery. Well, I think a major problem, I mean, there's not, so the major problem is actually, is that the, what the German advantage is, the, is they're capturing all this stuff. It's yeah. the Soviets, the reason why the Soviets have so few guns, one, they lose so many of the pre-war guns, and they're forced to ruthlessly cut down on what they're producing. This is something I think the Soviets do very well, that they're very ruthless in cutting down the number of variants of weaponry yeah. they produce as part of their war industries, ruthlessly just rationalizing and modernizing their industry. But the problem is, once again, but they just they lose all their pre-war stocks. So that's the advantage I think the Germans have is, yes, the Germans, I mean, they're basically taking everything that's, they're taking every armored vehicle they have and they're plopping a captured howitzer on it, but they have all those captured howitzers. And so, and so yes, it is a pro, I mean, it's a logistical problem to have so many different guns. But on the other hand, without those captured guns, I'd actually know for Barbarossa, that's kind of the inverse, they're actually using more captured weapons. You know, the Soviet army, sorry, the, the German army in 1939, they're heavily dependent upon the captured Czech weapons, just to even equip yeah. infantry divisions. Same thing, like these captured weapons are what allow them to really keep going. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it is a major logistical advantage for the Soviets and a major logistical logistical disadvantage for the Germans that they're having to all these different spare parts, all these different trucks. And on the note of Lendley, so it's actually kind of fascinating to really hit home the importance of explosive. You know, when Stalin, when they're during these inter-allied meetings, when they're talking about lend -lease, what are the three things that Stalin says? All right, no matter what, if you have trouble shipping things, these are the three things we need. Explosives, trucks, aluminum. Shells, trucks, shells, things to move the things, um, uh, trucks to move the guns, and aluminum for planes, aka, because the most important thing of a plane, it's not ground attack. It's clearing, it's like, just like in World War I, it is clearing the skies of enemy observers so you can have your own observer plane. Mm. It all comes down to the artillery. No, and that essentially is a really way to bring this to an end, but it's it's certainly, I think, not going to be your last uh, appearance here. I think we can hone in on some other aspect and use your data interpretation because it, there's so many levels with the eastern front particularly you know looking at looking at vehicles and soft skin transport <laughs> is, a, is a subject in its own right and look at the at the two armies across there we could look at you know the, the the training of artillery there's there's other 
yeah, there's other um, rabbit holes we could disappear mm -hmm. down with this. But, well, I, yeah, mm -hmm. that's absolutely amazing. So I'm going to um, – yeah, we've addressed well, most of the comments as we're going through. I'll just remind people what we've got coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye, as I always do. So, folks, I, I gave you what was coming up. We've got Jungles Week starting tomorrow, so uh, join us for that. So that's 5 p.m. UK time. We're going off to Guadalcanal with Brian Dimitrovich to talk about John Bazalone. So the discussion of Band of Brothers came up in the sidebar. This is – uh, episode two of the Pacific, which in fact, I'm going to go and watch episodes one and two of the Pacific in about five minutes time when I finish this stream. So I can refresh my memory for that. And then Lance Cedric on Monday, then we've got Robert Lyman coming on talking about uh, the among the headhunters, some great shows coming up at you. Then more stuff after that, but codes and cryptology week coming up, uh, North Africa week coming up, loads of good content coming your way. So as usual, don't forget to follow us on our Twitter and social media. Don't forget to be consider becoming a Patreon. Uh, Sasha's uh, Twitter details are in the description below, so you can get in contact by him. I will pass on his email address for anybody who wants it, so you can carry on your conversations about artillery or data, however you want to do that. That's fantastic. But right now, it means me to say thank you very much for joining us. And you're uh, me. really good. I, I really, I really learned a lot. There was a, two or three moments where my just little things you said, just I will, as you said, I will take away some of this stuff. And, and consider it when I'm reading books, this this ability to, to inflict violence. It's not all about the number of artillery pieces. It's about the, the, the mechanism behind them, essentially. So really fantastic. So, um, well, did you enjoy it as well? Very much so. Very, very much so. I, I really appreciated that. I really appreciated this opportunity. Yeah. And I just wanted to say, we said it before we went live, but this, the, 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 the selection of five guests I had this week exactly represents the type of five guests I want to bring together in theme weeks in the future. You know, the, the published authors, the professors, the, the, the student in Ollie's care, or not student, but student age group, someone talking about the fourth guards and someone like yourself who's data driven. That's how it always should be on World War II TV, not just the big authors, not just the amateurs, a nice blend of everybody but then me kind of holding it together in my own inimitable slightly um um odd style so there we go so folks thank you very much for your company i will see you all again tomorrow for jungles week this is paul Woodhead for world war ii tv saying thank you very much for giving us your attention this evening <laughs>